So what I'm going to talk about today is about something that's happened very, very, that's very, very interesting in terms of how I've been uh, led by my seniors over the last two or three years in ways that have had most interesting results. Um, it's also led me to becoming in demand at commercial business conferences, giving leadership speeches and, think, and uh, other conference attendances and chairing sessions at commercial conferences, which is kind of not the normal thing that we academics get involved with. And it was because of this thing about leadership. What also happened, which was rather interesting, was that the results of my students dramatically improved over the last three years. I want to set it in the context of the field that I work in, which is analytics, big data, and governance, how we use it correctly and so on. Um, but also in the context of the fact that we as academics get hammered every year by business people that we are producing technically capable graduates in any field but who are functionally uh, unemployable because they don't have the soft skills. And there's a rather interesting picture here of the left hand side with all the technical skills and the right hand side the most important part making students useful when they graduate, the soft skills. And we as academics, across the whole field, and I don't care whether you look at the science, the technology, engineering, man, um, math side, or whether you're looking at the softer side, we're very good at making sure they understand the domain. We're not really quite as good at soft skill development. And so I want to sort of co uh, concentrate today on how I've used that mm. picture that came from a big analytics software company about four years ago and show how that has changed and how I've been allowed to use that by an inspirational leadership to get some very interesting results. So I want to look a little bit today at leadership, what does it really mean? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the leads at the top of faculties or whether we're talking about our own personal leadership with our students. I want to look very briefly at some pedagogical issues, then put it into practice, and then show you just two slides of the results. And in terms of what we do, you understand the difference in management and leadership, I guess. I'll show you a little slide in a minute about leadership, but either you can be trying to sort of corral people from behind, the traditional shepherds or herding cats, which I found yes, those rather fun ones, or the rather interesting leadership picture there, which comes from the Middle East approach to leading the flock of sheep. Unlike in the West, where we are at the back with our sheep dogs trying to keep them all together. Look at how they're all keeping themselves together. And in the World War I, you know, the captain was the first up and everybody else was following. So are you trying to herd cats from behind with your students? Are you leading from the front? Are your bosses leading you from the front or are they too, the managers, keeping you under control, making sure you do all the right things and tick all the boxes? You see, here's a picture, five habits of a leader. Vision, passion, walking the talk, talking the walk and so on, and also communicating and courage. We, all, we need all of those characteristics. But I don't think they are anything like enough. Because if you go back, that wasn't what was happening here. Coming out of the trenches. Something completely different was going on as well. Inspiration and empowerment, I think, are the two most important aspects of leadership if you're going to get your team to follow you up out of the trenches. And often we feel like we are deep in the trenches, don't we? All those things coming overhead and landing on top of us. Four or five years ago, 
I was nearly ejected from the university. I was certainly ejected from the business school. I was rescued by the School of Computing. With inspiration and empowerment, to go fix things, try different ways of doing things. Try and get the, national, uh, the NSS, the National Student Satisfaction Survey, for the particular program up higher than it was. It was below par. So I was inspired, empowered, allowed to make mistakes. Because you learn from making a mistake, or you should do. And I was mentored as well and helped to do things in quite different ways that I'd never done before. Ways that were really, frankly, quite scary. I changed from being a technical domains expert. And so many of our colleagues know that they are the world expert in something. And that's all they'll teach. And they will spend hour after hour with their students transferring this incredible stuff in their head, at least into the ears of the students. They were bored, the students were. They didn't understand its context. They really didn't learn very much. It fell straight out the other ear if you even got in. What turns out to be far, far more effective as an academic is to forget the domain and be a learning mentor and guide. Students will learn if they are inspired with a subject, with a topic. And that's what I have changed from and to. So today, if I have, as I do, 12 weeks with, say, three hours contact time for a, a, a module, or in your terms, a course, in the past, I would use as many of those hours to pour new knowledge into their heads, because it's fun, it's interesting to me. Today, I spend very little time transferring any knowledge. It's all there, it's in books, it's on YouTube, it's everywhere. So I spend a short time introducing the topic, introducing the important questions and then set them off to learn by research. If you are a domain expert, the sage on the stage, like that, um, you get people turning up. And of course we monitor, a, uh, as a very important factor in understanding student behaviour, that useless surrogate attendance at lectures. That, I will show you at the very end, is a totally <coughs> valueless surrogate parameter. It should not even be considered. I'll show you why. If you are the sage on the side, that mentor of learning and studying, researching, communicating, then you have amazing levels of engagement. We have the technical experts, a sage on the stage, 50 slides for an hour, with 10, 12, 15 lines of text on each slide, and they are reading at a fantastic rate. We've seen that. Or else they have a sheet of paper, and they are reading word by word like that. We've seen that. 10 slides for a whole week's worth of work, including a type of slide and a context slide. That one with 50 slides takes you two hours to prepare, and you have to revise every single one of those every year as the world changes and moves on and new knowledge comes along. That one, you never have to change the slide. I've got a um, set of seminar packs now, which are 10 years old. I've, suddenly realise I have to take off the year at the bottom, the copyright year or whatever, because I don't need to change it. It's only got the questions there. I'll tell you more later on in the workshop. Do we teach answers or do we teach questions? If I teach you an answer, you stop learning. You know the answer. The only trouble is the world moves and changes, the context changes. And the answer for today's context is not the answer necessarily 
for tomorrow's context. So teach questions. People ask me, Richard, how's about in physics, uh, the law of gravity? That's the answer, isn't it? No, it's just a rather interesting question. Because m1, m2 over g, r squared times g is a formula, is allegedly the answer. No, lead ball, feather, everyone knows what happens. So if the world doesn't work like that, that formula now becomes a question, why isn't it working? What else do I need to ask to find out why the feather stays there, roughly, and the ball hits the floor instantly? Why can we drop a baby kitten, as we had this recently, off the 100th floor of a skyscraper, and it lands gently and walks away? Drop any of us from 100 floors, there's a serious splat. We don't walk away from it. So that law of gravity, that formula, is actually a useful question. And we can change our teaching in everything, whether it's literature, law, physics, anything, into sets of fabulous questions that set our students up for the future. So do we give them the big, thick text? But my reading lists are zero. I have no reading lists because my students are researching every session. I do not believe that I want to be constrained by one, the one textbook, or six, or eight, or ten. Why bother? And I can pose them the interesting big questions, and they can go find the answers. Because we've got to teach them how to collaborate, how to research, how to find the latest things. So the world is changing so staggeringly fast. Moving on to assessment. You guys, certainly people in America and France, are kind of a bit hampered by being required to have exams. We do not. I have no exams in my uh, uh, subjects. All coursework. Not only that, I give them a big question. They've got to find their narrow little bit that engages them, captures their interest. I give them subjects which are at the leading edge of where the world is today. Not six years ago. I don't even expect them to bother, mostly, with formal IEEE type of seriously upmarket, high grade research, because that's five years out of date. Because the research was done five years ago, it was analysed four years ago, it was put into a paper three years ago, it was submitted two years ago, it's been in review for a year or so, and then it goes into a year's publication. I'm interested in, in the questions and the answers which are being published yesterday because they are what keeping chief information officers awake at night today. Not five years ago. So I have no reading this, I set assignments, which are, I give them the first week of term, and they start working with me, and I start working with them all the way through. Getting them to use something that is of interest to them. They negotiate the topic with me. Generally in my fields there are no right or wrong answers either. There are just good questions that are well justified, fantastic questions that are exceptionally well justified, and rubbish questions where the critical thinking is useless. And it's remarkably easy, actually, to set up a rubric for that and to, re to assess it in about 10 to 15 minutes. Astonishingly quick to do. And it's tight. No handwriting, folks. So, they do that. They fix that. The technical stuff. There's YouTube, there's all the technical stuff out there. I spend almost all my time coaching and mentoring them on the soft skills. Curiosity and inquisitive. Now, our kids' education systems worldwide are staggeringly efficient at removing the curiosity of two and three-year-olds. By the time they get to us at 16 or 17, they've got no curiosity left because they've been taught that way. So to switch it back on is kind of interesting, kind of fun challenge. But they need it. We need them to be cre creative. 
come up with interesting and off-the-wall ideas to solve things. They're going to be able to identify problems, not just solve problems, but identify them. I don't give them a specific, uh, the detailed problem. I give them a big area. And then they go find little areas which they can actually write a five-page, 3,000-word article on or something. Yeah, we get them to work together, share ideas, but don't assess on collaborative aspects or on group work. That's lethal. Communication. Most of our graduates worldwide are pretty lousy at communication. I'm talking to uh, the head of the, the worldwide head of um, the Watson Analytics program from IBM recently, and they were doing some work with some uh, was it master's students, I think it was, out of one of the East Coast top end universities. A whole semester long project. Fortunately, they went in from IBM around about week eight or so for a kind of discuss, find out what was going on, how they got on. And he was horrified, although I was not surprised, that they had no understanding of how to communicate what they had come up with. They couldn't tell the story. Storytelling is the most important skill that we can give our students. Because it, the word storytelling, or phrase storytelling, popped out of the woodwork in business conferences about two years ago. Never been heard before then, and now the phrase storytelling turns up all the time. And so we've now moved our program on the analytics program to a lot of our assessment is based around communication and storytelling. They don't show us their software code that they've done for the analytics. They give a five or 10 or 15 minute presentation about the problem and what they've come up with. So, and we don't teach them how to do a video, they go find out. And the results of this are quite interesting that they now, as we started off in the first year, reinforce it the second year and the third year and so on, they get good at doing this. So we're working on the soft skills while they sort out and learn those technical skills, whether it's new languages, new systems, whatever. In the PDF notes version, there's a link underneath here to where you can find some of these presentations. This one was a spectacular piece of work. Beautifully presented. It's at one of our partner uh, universities in um, Dakar, over in um, Bangladesh. And he, that guy did a stupendous job. It was a, finally an undergraduate project. The results of this way of inspiring and leading your students, as long as you've been inspired and led by your seniors at faculty level, well, on my modules, finally a grade average is somewhere north of 68%, typically 75% of the grade average. Typically 95 to 100% first pass <coughs> uh, rate. <coughs> And anywhere between 75 and 100% score more than 60%. So there are two ones and above in English terms. More interesting, this is what brought me to the note, notice of our seniors at the university, was this bit about the BMI, BMEI, Black Minority Ethnic Grade Deficit, which most Western universities have a problem with. Uh, it used to be about 20%, in the UK it's now about 10%-ish or so. My modules between 0% and 5%, and sometimes the black and minorities actually do better than the white Caucasian UK uh, students. The art reason for that is that I spend a lot of time with every single student. Because I know that I don't have to transfer knowledge, I can spend time each week in workshops, working with each one, reviewing where they're going. Share, helping them with their ideas, developing their ideas. It means that each student now achieves their own potential, not some stereotypical uh, group, oh, you're a bothersome character, I can't be bothered to see you again, go away. You spend time to give them the time that they need. And because I'm giving everybody a, si uh, a single or almost always a single assignment, an article, a report in a particular standard, 
Week eight, I cancel everything. I don't need to transfer knowledge. I spend time doing a final draft formative review to the, the rubric. And then they, ha and they come through on the in my office on a schedule of 12 to 15 minutes each. Then they have four weeks to fix it. And then they come through after the, during the exam week. And I will see them again and mark them all there. It means I don't have any marking overhang at home. I'm doing in class because I know I'm not teaching them the subject I'm teaching them how to be good students how to learn well how to present teaching them all of those soft skills that are going to be valuable for them it makes a difference <clears throat> to be allowed to do that to be empowered to do that was a critical change because I would never have dared do that before but I was allowed to because it might work let's see what happens are we interested in attendance at all of our modules, at all of our lectures and seminars and so on? Of course, everybody says, yes, we are. You've got to get a 95% attendance level, otherwise you'll have problems. R squared equals 0.3%. The correlation between attendance at my lectures and tutorials and grade. Because they're not engaging with the process, they're engaging with their topic. Because they have taken themselves to the water, they are drinking the water. You can't take a horse to water and make it drink, but if, you leave, if it goes there by itself, it will drink. And those sort of... Uh, these are the grades along there. See, just two, three on that particular year that down at the 50s, 51, 52. This year it's a little bit better, we've only got one down here, all the rest are up here. Because they have engaged with their subject, they've engaged with their research, they've engaged with their writing, engaged with their communication. So I put it to you, if you do things the right way, attendance as a surrogate for engagement with their studies is a totally valueless parameter. So your challenge from me, are you going to step, become, or are you a domain expert herding sheep, or are you going to become, or have you already become, an inspirational leader of your students? Thank you.